My name is Temu Raskola, and my book is called Legal Orientalism, China, the United States, and Modern Law. So the book is really an exploration of ideas of what is law, who decides, who gets to decide who has it, and these kind of ideas about American law and Chinese law and kind of comparative history of how these ideas have circulated globally and what some of their effects have been both in China and also in the United States. The term Orientalism, of course, is this idea developed by the literary scholar Edward Said about um, a certain way of talking about East versus the West, uh, East versus West, where uh, there are these kind of opposi binary oppositions, and it turns so. For example, the West is individualistic; uh, it's progressive, it's democratic. Uh, the East is often then collectivist, um, despotic, uh, traditional, or stagnant. Even so, I want by the term legal Orientalism. Then I want to think about why is it that we tend to associate law, in particular, with the West and lawlessness with the East. Uh, I teach Chinese law, among other things, and it, it, uh, when people would ask me what I do, they would off, and I would tell them I teach Chinese law, often they would say, there is no such thing. And I used to find that a little bit irritating, but people offered that thought with such consistency. They actually became interested in thinking about why is it that people really so insistently believe that there is no law in China, at least not what they consider real law. Today, I think often people think it's, it's uh, rule by law, which is a term you often hear contrasted with rule of law. It's simply whatever the government or the party decides, and they can sort of uh, compromise it at, at any, any moment. Interestingly, actually, if you go far enough back, uh, the first views of uh, Chinese law in the West were actually quite positive. It was the Jesuit missionaries who went to Ch China in the 16th century who painted this quite glowing portrait of um, of China as a country that was ruled by by virtue and and law, it's really only uh, with Montesquieu in the 18th century who starts developing this idea of an Oriental despotism uh, that uh, turns into a kind of European philosophical prejudice about Chinese law and Chinese government. And then by the time you get to the 19th century, of course, the main source of information about China is no longer well-educated Jesuit missionaries, but uh, uh, traders, especially British traders, who then start complaining that Chinese law is arbitrary, it's despotic, it doesn't make sense. So that's really when we start getting these very negative views about China. When the British uh, first uh, uh, decided to force China open for free trade uh, in the Opium War, and when that war first began, actually, interestingly, the Americans first sided with the Chinese against the British, because they thought that, of course, the war started when the Chinese confiscated British opium and dumped it into the Canton Harbor. Well, for the Americans, this represented a British imperial intervention with trade and very much reminded of their own revolutionary history, which started also with the dumping of, of uh, British tea in the Boston Harbor. Interestingly, though, uh, the British were not happy simply with get, gaining trade access to China. They also wanted what they called the right of extraterritorial jurisdiction on the theory that Chinese law was indeed too barbaric, barbaric to apply to them. They insisted that uh, they should not be subject to Chinese law even while in China. The United States, of course, at its found is founding rejected the idea of territorial colonialism on the British model. So uh, what we see, though, at the, after the end of the Opium War that the United States, however, takes on this British or European practice of uh, non-territorial or extraterritorial kind of legal imperialism. And that happens more than half a century before the U.S. finally, with the Spanish-American War, does uh, embark on territorial colonialism as well on the, on the European model with the acquisition of uh, the Philippines and, and uh, Cuba and Puerto Rico. Well, what are the implications of this history and this kind of comparative enterprise for thinking about, chi say, Chinese, uh, Chinese legal reform today and U.S. law reform projects in China in particular? I think those projects are important and have a great deal of value. Clearly, there is a very strong Chinese party state. Clearly, there is such a thing as real human rights violations in China and elsewhere. But I. I it, this history doesn't have any direct implications, but I think it does caution us just to be a little bit more mindful in how we phrase our suggestions, proposals for reform, and just to be mindful of, uh, of this kind of imperial history. So, uh, in a sense, rule of law, democracy, 
another term that uh, is often hard to define, uh, they should ultimately, ideally, at least emerge indigenously. Because the idea of imposing rule of law, imposing democracy on somebody else, of course, would be an oxymoron. So, so I guess the strategy really would be to engage in a negotiation uh, around these issues uh, rather than uh, simply prescription.